I want to start off by saying Shalom Lach, Mash Pacha. Hope all is well with you, family. Um, this is Pastor Kelly Richardson, and um, this presentation for um, this evening is Thanos, the quest for all power. So I'm sure all you guys have already by now have seen the movie Infinity War by uh, Marvel Comics. And so with that being said, this presentation is based off of that movie. And I want to make this uh, clear that this is not a movie review, but this is a revealing of the things that I, 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 I saw in this movie that really stood out and caught my attention. And so I'm going to bring uh, the things, the subliminals that I saw to your attention. So that way you can see that there is more to this movie than what you see on the surface. All right. So Thanos, the quest for all power. So let's get started. Here we go. I want to start off by setting the tone with Second Timothy uh, chapter four, verse three. And it says, for the time will come when they will not endure a sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. This is a powerful, profound prophecy that the Apostle Paul shared with Pastor Timothy. And he said, for the time will come, and we're living in that time, where people are not enduring sound doctrine, falling by the wayside, having itching ears, in other words, always looking for the supposed latest and greatest revelation, always looking for something new. So let's go to verse four. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. All right. So it says, and they, this is referring to the people of the most high God. This is of course referring to Israel, right? And um, all the followers of the Most High God, saying that they shall turn their ears from the truth and it shall be turned unto fables. All right. So we see that playing out right now. We see this playing out, this prophecy being fulfilled right now in this present time. All right. So. Let's start off by uh, diving deeper into Thanos. All right, let me just give you some information about Thanos. The name Thanos comes from the Greek word Athanasios. All right, I'll say it again. The name Thanos comes from the Greek word Athanasios. Athanasios, both the long and short name, Thanasius means immortal. Immortal means deathless, undying, in other words, of gods, imperishable, endless. Thanos, and this is according to the Marvel Universe, Thanos was born as one of the last sons of the original colonists called the Eternals. Okay, so make a note of original colonists. Okay, so again, Thanos was born as one of the last sons of the original colonists called the Eternals. So let's deal with Thanos' agenda. Let's deal with his agenda. Here's a quote from Thanos, little one, and he's engaging in discussion with uh, Gamora, right? And giving her clarity on his drive, his agenda, uh, his goal, his purpose, his intent on doing what he's doing, or should I say, in doing what he's doing, all right? And this is what he says, little one, it's a simple calculus. This universe has finite its resources, finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correcting. And then he goes on to say this. I'm the only one who knows that. At least I'm the only who the will to act on it. For a time you had that, that same will as you fought by my side, daughter. I'll read it one more time. He says, I'm the only one who knows that. At least I'm the only who the will to act on it. For a time, 
you had that same will as you fought by my side daughter all right so on the surface right you get the impression based upon this in the, uh, this exchange that Thanos his concern is bringing balance to the universe all right to the uh, to, to all creation right his concern is that there is a finite amount of resources the resources is uh, they're depleting as the population of life continues to expand and so now his concern is to now kill off half of life right so that way to bring balance to the overall universe all right but I'm going to show you here that his agenda goes far beyond that all right and I, I know for sure if Marvel would have put or, or added this portion of his agenda to the movie that the movie would not have done as good as it done all right as it did all right the movie went on to gross over a billion dollars one billion dollars worldwide okay so let's see what his real agenda is here his agenda is driven by his love for death I'll say it again Thanos his agenda is driven by his love for death according to the Marvel Universe Thanos was deeply in love with death Thanos once met death itself as it appeared to him embodied in a female form Thanos was infatuated in other words he had a foolish passion with the being and endeavored to make himself worthy in order to earn her love in return Thanos fell so much in love with death that he was willing to destroy the universe in order to please her indeed nearly all of Thanos's activities from that point on involved his desire to win death's favor so make a note that Thanos he was willing to destroy the universe in order to please her in other words uh, Marvel comics refer to her as Lady Death and this is her image right here now this is a clip from the Marvel comics and this is Thanos pleading his love for Lady Death and this is what he says for you what do I have to do kill another universe another another after that I'll do it I'll do anything don't turn away so when Thanos possessed virtual uh, uh, omnipotence by means of the infinity gauntlet however death for reasons of its own turned its back on him one by one Thanos collected five other soul gems combining them all in a huge single synthetic soul gem he then began to extinguish the very stars themselves hoping thereby to extinguish all living things in tribute to death so again his entire uh, agenda is to satisfy death lady death now this is his quote let's let's give clarity to this quote that he says in this comic book clip what do I have to do kill another universe what did he mean when he said that to lady death this is what he meant all right and I'm going to explain the uh, the, the, the image that you see to the right of your screen all right uh, you see the virgin in the middle you see the mother and to the right you see crone all right the hag well, let me explain this uni all right the word universe or universe comes from uni plus verse all right uni a Struskin name for the great mother's holy trinity a three-in-one goddess who gave birth to the universe she was represented by the single 
or should I say by the sign of female genitals, Uni was a cognate of Yanni. In Rome, the three were worshipped as the earlier Capitoline triad of Virgin Mother Crone. And so those images that, I, that you see to the bottom right, which is popular in Wicca, witchcraft, and other mystical systems, uh, again, to the left, you see the Virgin. In the middle, you see the Mother. And to the right, you see Crone which represents Juventus, Juno, and Minerva, all right? But nevertheless, what is Thanos saying when he says, kill another universe? What is he saying here? This is what he's saying, that he has killed and is willing to kill other goddesses. He's killed other women, all right? I'll say this again. He has killed and is willing to kill other goddesses, other universes, you know, goddesses, as well as uh, destroying doctrines. OK, he he's killed other women. So this is what he's saying to Lady Death to try to win her love. OK. So because of his love for death and his drive to obtain the soul stone. Thanos sacrificed his daughter, Gomorrah. All right, I'll say that again. Because of his love for Lady Death and his drive to obtain the soul stones, Thanos sacrificed his daughter, Gomorrah. This is an exchange between Thanos and the Red Skull, all right, as he was um, seeking to obtain the soul stone. All right, this is Thanos. Of what? Red Skull response, in order to take the stone, you must lose that which you love. The stone demands a sacrifice. All right. So the Red Skull is telling Thanos in order to uh, obtain the stone that he's been assigned to guard. Red Skull was assigned to guard in order to obtain this particular this particular stone. Thanos will have to what? Give a blood sacrifice of the one that he loves, someone that he loves. And of course, uh, he has a passion for death, but that's not what it means. OK, so that's why he sacrificed Gomorrah. All right. And I could break down the altar, but I'm not going to get into that right now. That's a whole nother uh, discussion here. But I encourage you guys to view the presentation that I've, I've done on the glows, the secrets of Freemasonry, the glows, Greek letter organizations. But nevertheless, let's uh, get back to this here. So again, Thanos of what? Red Skull, in order to take the stone, you must lose that which you love. The stone demands a sacrifice. So let's break down um, a couple of things here. Let me give you some clarity here. Let's deal with the soul stone real quick. All right. So the soul stone of Marvel Comics was a somewhat sentient creature that can trap souls inside another world. All right. So with the with this particular soul stone, this particular stone, this gives the power of anyone that's controlling this stone to be able to place a person basically in heaven or hell, banish them to anywhere in the universe that that person chooses. All right. So that's what uh, that's why Thanos was seeking out to obtain this particular stone. OK, now, is there a coincidence that the name Gomorrah sounds like Gomorrah from the scriptures? Is there a coincidence? All right. The name Gomorrah, according to the scriptures, means ruin. Gomorrah, according to the scriptures, means ruin. OK, John 3, 16, for God, Allah, I am, all right, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'll read it again. For God, Yahweh, Allah, I am, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, so you see the most high God sacrificed his son in order to bring forth life. Right. But Thanos sacrificed his daughter in order to what? Bring forth death. Okay. So what is the infinity gauntlet? What is this infinity gauntlet? What is it? The infinity gauntlet was designed to hold six of the soul gems better known as the infinity gems when used in combination their already impressive powers make the wearer able to do anything they want okay so is the infinity gauntlet a parallel to the hand of god by yad allah all right is the infinity gauntlet a parallel to the hand of god by yad allah OK, that is the paleo pronunciation, the paleo Hebrew pronunciation of hand of God. OK. Now, let me just break down the explanation of each of the six stones. Let me give you an explanation of each of the six stones. Let me break this down for you. OK. Let's start with the mind stone. The mind stone lets the owner control the minds of others. Then we have the reality stone. The aether is a red floating liquid thing that attaches to a host, makes him or her stronger. In the comics, it's more focused on wish fulfillment. Then we have the power stone. The power stone gives the wielder incredible power, superhuman strength, shooting beams of purple destruction, and possibly wiping out all organic life from a planet just by touching the surface. Then we have the space stone, all right, which is also called the Tesseract. The space stone is a blue stone capable of teleporting anything from one point in the universe to the other. Then we have the time gem, all right, the time stone. The time stone gives the capabilities to visit the future, alter the past, speed up and slow down the passing of time, stay young forever. And lastly, we have the soul gem, the soul stone. The soul stone of Marvel Comics was a somewhat sentient creature that can trap souls inside another world. And this is the very stone that uh, Thanos sacrificed his daughter, Gamora, in order to obtain this particular stone. All right? So Thanos wrestles the gems from their owners, which they are called elders right and gains mastery over power mind space reality time and the soul now what are the origins of these stones what is the origin of these six stones where did they come from all right let me show you the origin of these six stones they come from the chakras okay now there's seven major chakras that we're going to deal with and I'm going to show you that these stones come from the chakras okay every individual stone had an elder in other words a God supposedly watching over it like the soul stones in Marvel Universe every chakra has a Hindu god or goddess associated with it, okay? Now, many of you have chakras. Many of the people of the Most High God have chakras and really, truly do not understand what they are. And matter of fact, many of you are exposed to chakras and don't even realize that they are chakras, starting with games like Candy Crush, all right? They have those so-called gems. Those are actually chakras. All right. But nevertheless, 
let's move forward here let's continue on here so let's deal with the seven major chakras let's start with the first chakra which is called the mul adhara right chakra the color is yellow uh, the meaning of this particular chakra is foundation base all right the location is the perineum below the genitals and above the anus inside the coccyx the pelvic plexus base of the spine the first three vertebrae and the work organ is the anus all right so the triangle in other words the downward pointing triangle in the pericarp is very important because it is the seat of the dormant vital life force kundalini shakti depicted in the form of a serpent coiled around the Savai Yamba, all right, or Yambu, excuse me, Savai Yambu ligam at its center, all right, ligam in Hindu means phallic, all right, all it is is a phallus, right, a male reproductive organ, sex organ. At its center, it is also known as tripura, tri means three, pure, pure means worlds, okay? Now, let me give you a little more information on Kundalini, okay? Kundalini, tantric image of the female serpent coiled in the lowest chakra of the human body in the pelvis, and aim of tantric yoga was to realize Kundalini by certain exercises and meditations such as yani mudra all right which is a uh, contraction of the perineal muscles training men to suppress ejaculation if kundalini could be induced to uncoil and mount through the spinal chakras to the brain the adept would experience the bliss of her emergence as the thousand petaled locust as you see the image in the bottom right what you see on the head is the thousand petaled lotus, okay? From the top of the head, which meant union of the self with the infinite, right? Uh, so Tibetan lamas still consider uh, the most secret, sacred mantra, the one that wakens the sleeping Kundalini and causes her to rise, okay? Next we have Shakti. All right, Shakti, uh, this tantric title of the great goddess, Kali Ma, realized both as a sexual partner and as the innermost animating soul of man or God. Like the Greek psyche, uh, the Roman anima, the Gnostic Sophia, the Kabbalistic Shekinah or Shekinah or Shekinah, yes. <laughs> You're not seeing, you're not reading this wrong. <laughs> yes, Shekinah comes from Shakti. Those that have the creators of this Kabbalistic uh, mystical teaching, right? Use this system to introduce the worship of Shakti disguised as the Shekinah. So guess what? Inside the church, you see so many singing songs called uh, uh, from Shekinah uh, Glory, that is a group called Shekinah Glory. You even have songs that has uh, the term Shekinah in it. You have ministries that call themselves Shekinah, right? So that is a made-up term that, that comes right out of the worship of Shakti, all right? Shakti Shekinah, all right? Go figure, right? So all of these goddesses that I mentioned is based on the Shakti. Jung said that she was the uh, the figure known as my lady soul. And so according to their doctrine, they teach that every mother and every beloved is forced to become the carrier and embodiment of the um, uh, omnipresent and ageless image, which corresponds to the deepest reality of man. OK, so let's go to the next chakra. All right. Let's go to the second chakra, the spa at his thana. All right. I'll say it again. Spa at his thana. 
All right. So the color of this particular chakra is uh, of water. All right. Transparent, white, light blue. OK, the color of water, transparent, white, light blue. OK, the meaning of this particular chakra is dwelling place of the self. OK, so spa means self or um, prana and at his thana means dwelling place. And so, again, it also means six petals. All right. So the location of this particular chakra is in the genital region. All right. The hypogastric plexus. The working organ is the genitals. All right. So yantra form the circle with crescent, the circle representing representing the element water is to be colored white. And so the crescent inside the circle is associated with the moon. And so it is colored silver. And so the combination of the crescent moon with the circle and the yantra of the Svahisthana chakra clearly establishes the relationship between water and the moon. All right. So you see, uh, as you see so far with the chakras that I presented, you see the association of what elements, uh, gods, right? Those are two things that you see that's associated so far with these chakras, right? Okay. Let's deal with Vishnu real quick. Let's deal with Vishnu. Vishnu, right? A Vedic God representing both the sacrificial boar and the phallus. This is important. See, uh, when you understand the scriptures, when it tells us that Daniel purposed in his heart not to what defile himself, right? This is saying that Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not eat swine. He will not eat pork. Why? Because uh, swine was part, it, it was food from the king's table. It was food that was used to uh, worship these idols, okay? So, Vedic God, representing both the sacrificial boar and the phallus, his name meant he who embraces, pervades, or penetrates. He was known as the expander and he who excites men. His emblem was a legam, legam, remember, that is a phallus, that is a phallus, a male reproductive organ. Yanni, that is the female reproductive organ. So it says a legam, yanni, composed of a male cross with a female circle called the sign Kiakra. All right. So this is nothing more but, a, but, but a, an image of intimacy, of intercourse. So when held by Vishnu, it signifies his power to penetrate, okay, heaven and earth. Like I said, that Legam Yani, right, is dealing with intimacy, all right? It's a sex symbol. So the boar's tusk was identified with his phallus because it was the tusk that effected Vishnu's mating with the um, the primal goddess earth all right and this is according to that literature he uprose bearing on his tusk the fair goddess earth he uprose bearing on his tusk again the fair goddess earth shedding in all directions the brine of the cosmic sea so boar's tusk often represent valley and oceanic in far eastern cultures so let's deal with another chakra here the mani pura chakra which is the third chakra the color is red like fire or the rising sun this uh, particular name for this chakra means city of jewels all right or gems so mani means jewel or gem pura means dwelling place and so the location at the vertebral column that corresponds to the navel region. OK, so Yantra form is the inverted triangle that is fiery red in color. 
The triangle is the symbol for the fire element. Through this element, manifested energy is given a form. In other words, Rupa. The triangle is the simplest rigid geometric form. It needs only three sides. And yet it is an entity in itself, right? So the inverted triangle suggests the movement of energy downward it obstructs the upward movement of Kundalini until it is pierced. Still making reference to what? Intimacy. Let's go to the next one here. All right, let's deal with the fourth chakra, the Anahata chakra. All right, the color, right? Gray or smoky green. All right, the shape, the yantra. All right, hexagram or six pointed star. The work organ is the hands. So yantra form, the hexagram or six pointed star symbolizes the air elements, which moves in all four directions as well as upward and downward. Air is the vital life force, prana. It aids the functions of the lungs and the heart. Circulating fresh oxygen and vital energy the star is composed of two overlapping uh, in intersecting triangles. One points upward symbolizing Shiva, the male principle, and the other triangle pointing downwards and symbolizes who? Shakti, the female principle. So the star represents the balance that is attained when these two principles are joined in harmony. Again, sexual intimacy. That's what this is. Uh, stating here that's the illustration that it's giving right here okay now let's deal with the hexagram all right the familiar design of two interlocked triangles is generally supposed to have represented the Jewish faith since the time of David or Solomon therefore this hexagram is known as Megan or Magan David or Magan Dawad all right which is called the shield of David or the star of David or Solomon's seal. Actually, the hexagram had nothing to do with either David or Solomon. It was not mentioned in Jewish literature until the 12th century AD. It was not adopted as a Jewish emblem until the 17th century. So the real history of the hexagram began with tantric Hinduism, where it represented, again, as I pointed out, union of the sexes. Again, the downward pointing triangle was the female primordial image, or should I say Yanni Yantra, existing for the, or for the universe. In the course of infinite time, the goddess received a spark of life within her triangle, Bendu. All right. So, Let's deal with the Magan David or the Magan Dawid. All right, let's deal with that. Shield of David. And I already highlighted this um, dealing with the hexagram, but let me give you just a little more information on this. The Shield of David, the so-called Star of David or hexagram constructed of two interlocked triangles now accepted as a symbol of Judaism. Actually, it was not associated with Judaism until the late Middle Ages, the 12th century AD, and was not officially accepted as a Jewish symbol until the 17th century. So the original source of the Magan Dawad or Magan David was the Tantric Great Yantra, which stood for a union of what? The sexes, the downward pointing triangle being female, the upward pointing one male, the two signifying the e eternal union of God and goddesses or goddess rather. So the capitalistic sex worship brought the Yantra into Jewish tradition. Okay. That's a fact. That is a fact. So many of you guys are wearing this star. Many of you guys are wearing this hexagram following the most high God and not realizing that you are wearing, uh, um, symbols and idols of another God.
or goddess that deals with what sex worship. And this is why among the people of the most high God, there's a lot of perversions that is among his people that should not be there. Why? Because guess what? These symbols, these images have spirits associated with it. But nevertheless, not trying to preach here. All right, let's move along here. So make a note. Dealing with the um, hexagram as well as the, the star of David. One points upward, symbolizing Shiva, the male principle, and the other triangle points downward and symbolizes Shakti. Okay, now let's deal with Shiva. All right, let's deal with Shiva. Shiva is the oldest god of the Vedic male trinity. And so the Vedic male trinity is Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. I'll say it again. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Formed in imitation of the older female trinity, like the great goddess whose son, lover, and victim he was, Shiva had many names. Sometimes he alone was a trinity or a three-headed god, bearer of the trident or triple phallus, which enabled him to mate with the triple mother. All right. That triple mother again, remember we dealt with that, the virgin, the mother, and the crone, the hag. All right. So, but nevertheless, let's let's move forward here. So Shiva was called what? Lord of Yoga. I'll say it again. Shiva was called Lord of Yoga, of the yoke that bound him to the goddess. He was also Lord of Death, called Shiva, the corpse, prostrate under the feet of Kali as she devoured his entrails, a Hindu parallel of the dead. Osiris, right, uh, shown as the steel heart, a mummy dead and yet alive. All right. And I'm sure you guys know the story of Osiris, Isis and Horus. You know that uh, Osiris was killed by his brother Seth, chopped up, dismembered and tossed into the river Nile. And so Isis was able to gather all his body parts with the exception of his phallus, which was supposedly eaten by a catfish, all right? And so she took his body, mummified his body. And if you understand um, the Egyptian um, religion, right? A dismembered body or a body that's missing, a part could not go into or make that transition into the afterlife. So because she could not find his phallus or able to recover his phallus, she created a golden phallus, right? And it doesn't stop there. And she began to copulate with this dead body, this corpse, okay? She began to copulate with this corpse, right? You see it right here. It says he also, he was also Lord of Death called Shiva, the corpse, right? Prostrate under the feet of Kali. So, uh, she copulated with a corpse. This is where you get the term necrophilia, all right? So when you understand this right here, this is what promoting and giving you the story of necrophilia. In other words, intimacy, attraction to what? Dead bodies, all right? So it says here, a Hindu parallel of the dead Osiris shown as the still heart, a mummy, dead and yet alive. And again, the story of Horus, um, when Isis copulated with the dead body of Osiris, she had Horus. Thus, many try to say this is where you get the story of Yahweh Shai Hamashayak, Jesus Christ from. Go figure. But nevertheless, let's deal with Kali. Since I started off with that, um, mentioned her in the previous um, slide. Let's deal with Kali Ma. She is also known as the Dark Mother. All right. The Hindu triple goddess of creation. 
That is just another way of saying what? Universe. Okay, remember we covered that. So universe, all right? The Hindu triple goddess of creation, preservation, and destruction, all right? Now most commonly known in her destroyer aspect, squatting over her dead consort, Shiva, and devouring his entrails while her yani sexually devours his legam. What this is saying here again, she is having what? Sex with a dead body. She is, uh, is engaging in what is called necrophilia. All right, so it says, while her yani, this is referring to her sexual organ, devours his legam, right? Which is the penis, right? Kali is the hungry earth which devours its own children and fattens, okay, on their corpses. It is in India that the experience of the terrible mother has been given its most grandiose form as Kali. But all this, and it should not be forgotten is an image not only of the feminine but particularly and specifically of the maternal for in a profound way life and birth are always bound up with death and destruction all right so let me show you something here all right you guys i'm sure you recognize who she is all right Now, y'all recognize her, right? That is Beyonce. All right? That is Beyonce. Notice what's on her shirt. Kali, all right? We just dealt with Kali, right? She has Kali, even though she has an E as to an I, but that was deceptively done. But we're not going to stop here. Pay attention to the dancing that she does, all right? So she is doing what is called the kali dance of death so where we just read how kali would stand over shiva right and use her yani right to subdue and eat cannibalism the ligam of shiva right so she was doing what is called a kali dance of death so what we described um, with Kali and Shiva and how they interacted with each other, that necrophilia, right, um, is what is called the Kali death dance or dance of death. And so that's what you saw Beyonce doing here. And notice her position. Notice how she's sitting here. Notice she has the Playboy, um, um, Playboy bunny or Playboy shirt on. And if you understand the image of the rabbit, the hare, you'll understand the association with sex. OK, so notice her position here. So she did the Kali dance of death. Wake up, people. Wake up, people. Now, let's get back to the chakras. Let's deal with the fifth chakra. Vish Huda, right? This chakra, the color is smoky purple. The meaning is pure throat, lotus, all right? Uh, so, uh, kant means throat, pad ma means lotus, all right? So, 16 petals, all right? Shodash is 16, dala petals, okay? So, it's located in the neck region, the throat, the carotid. Uh, plexus, the um, cervical part of the spinal column that corresponds to the neck. All right, so the yantra form is the crescent with a white circle inside of it. Okay, so let's let's move forward here. Let's get to the sixth chakra because I don't want to take up a lot of your time, and I want to get back to um, our overall objective in exposing the Infinity War. Okay, but nevertheless, let's deal with the sixth chakra. Ajna chakra, right? Which is the sixth chakra. The color is transparent 
uh, luminescent, bluish, or camphor white. All right, the meaning of this particular chakra, it means command, point between the eyebrows, all right? So Shakti, right? This is the goddess that's associated with this chakra, right? Shakti, which is also referred to as Hakini, right? Goddess Hakini is the doorkeeper of the sixth chakra. Through uh, concentration on her, the Sat Haka gets all the necessary powers and qualities to be able to work in the Ajna chakra. So the pale pink color of her body indicates the fully aroused Kundalini, absorbing all energies and moving upwards. So let's go to the last one here. Let's deal with the seventh chakra. Sahas Rara chakra. All right. The color is gold. The meaning is thousand petaled. Void. Dwelling place without support. Okay. The yantra form circle as a full moon. In some scriptures, and when I say scriptures, this is not referring to our holy um, Bible, or shall I say our holy Dabar HaKwadash. This is referring to their literature. All right. In some scriptures, their scriptures, the yantra is mentioned as Purna. Chandra, in other words, Purna means full, Chandra means moon, and others as Narakara, in other words, it means formless. Above the sphere is an umbrella of 1,000 lotus petals, arranged in the variegated colors of the rainbow. All right, so let's summarize each one of these chakras. All right, so again, the seven major chakras are associated with the areas of the body. It is associated with elements as well. And it's, they are also associated with um, gods and goddesses. OK, so number one, uh, the Maladhara chakra, the base of the spine, the element of the earth. All right. The Svahisthana chakra, the genitals, the element water. All right. Manipura chakra, the navel, and the element fire. The Anahata uh, chakra um, is associated with the heart and the element air. The Vishuddha chakra is associated with the throat and the element Akasha, right? Akasha, which is void or space. The Ajna chakra, which is the point between the eyebrows and the Mahatat the combination of the essence of all the elements in their purest form. Lastly, we have the Sahas Rara Chakra, which is the crown of the head, transcending all elements. Influence includes the Sama Chakra associated with the area above the third eye or the point between the eyebrows. OK, now I want to make this clear. I want you to understand this, that the worship of the four elements is important in phallic worship. I'll say it again. The worship of the four elements is important. It is vital in phallic worship. All right. This is coming from a book titled uh, Christian Wicca, the Trinitarian Tradition. All right. Yes, there are people that call themselves Christian witches. And yes, Many of them are inside the church, okay? And I encourage everyone to go to Pastor Jerry Carr and myself, our YouTube channel titled As Gods, right? And you will see a video on Christian witches and we expose Christian witches that are out there. Their purpose is to go inside ministries, infiltrate ministries by way of their praise team in their intercessory prayer, right, to what? Completely bring down that ministry, all right? But nevertheless, let's see what they say about the elements, all right? So the four elements are associated with the Makuth sphere. Many consider the elements to be a lower form of angels. I'll say it again. Many consider the elements to be a lower form of angels. The elements of earth, air, 
fire and water are instrumental to the concepts of Wicca and are the building blocks of all creation. All right. This is another uh, uh, another bullet that I want to highlight from this same book, and it is called the Suggested Circle Closing Statement. And it says, we thank the elements. May they go and power. All right. So you see here, they are worshiping the elements. All right. They are giving, or should I say, paying homage to the elements. Okay. So, Yahweh Alahayim is not in any of the elements. I'll say it again. Yahweh Alahayim, right, which is um, translated in English to Father God, right? So, or Lord God. But I preferably would rather say Yahweh Alahayim so you know exactly who I am referring to, okay? And that's one of the issues now because just because you say you believe in God does not mean that you're referring to the same. All right. Does not mean that you're referring to Yahweh Alahayim. All right. And his son, Yahweh Shai Hamashik, which would be Ban Alahayim. And also um, the Rawak Alahayim, which is the spirit of the Most High God. All right. So Yahweh Alahayim is not in any of the elements. Let me give you scripture. First King 1911. It says this. And this is Elijah. This is the Most High God encouraging the prophet Elijah because he decided to take off running and he kind of gotten into a suicidal mindset because he did what the Most High God commanded him to do. He slayed over 850 priests, right, by the sword. And now he's fleeing. He's running for his life because now he's scared of the threat that Jezebel posed on his life. And so here we see the Most High God encouraging the prophet Elijah. Let's read it. And it reads, And he said, Go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord, Yahweh, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquakes. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord, Yahweh, was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So I'm here to tell you this scripture right here. The reason why the Most High God gave this illustration to the prophet to his prophet is because uh, like I pointed out before the elements is vital to idol worshiping and so the most high God made it clear that he is not in any of these things right but we have the power to do what control these things all right so we're not in we're, we're not to worship these elements we're not to worship these things that the most high God created. We're, we're, we're supposed to worship the creator, right? Not the creation. We we appreciate the things he's done for us. That's what we call worship, right? But we are to what? Worship only the most high God. So here, this scripture right here nips in the bud that the most high God is not in any of these um, elements that people are worshiping because the elements are not angels and he's not in any of these rocks which are called chakras he's not in none of that okay so let's get back to thanos so according to the marvel universe infinity of war thanos is a god all right i purposely put the indefinite article there all right so Thanos is a god, all right? According to Marvel Universe, Infinity War, Thanos is a god. So this is the a, 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 a bullet from the opening scene of this movie. This is a verbal exchange between Thanos, right, Thor and Loki, and this is what Thanos says. This is what he says in that opening scene. 
I know what it's like to lose, to feel so desperately that you're right, but to fail nonetheless. I ask you to what end? Dread it, run from it. Destiny arrives all the same, and now it's here. Or should I say, I am? Hmm. Interesting, right? He uses the term, I am. Ahaya, that is the paleo pronunciation of I am. Here we see where this comes from. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And it says, in God, right? Yahweh, right? Alahayim is who we are referring to. But in God, Alahayim said, Unto Moses, Masha, I am, all right, Ahaya, that, Asha, Ahaya, all right, I am, that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, in other words, Ahaya, have sent me unto you, okay? Now, what Ahaya means is, it's a declaration of saying that what? I exist. Because the dilemma wasn't the issue of the children of Israel knowing the name of the Most High God. The issue was all they knew was the oppression. All they knew was bondage. They knew the name, but they no longer believed in the power behind it because all they saw again was the oppression uh, of the Egyptians. Okay, so the Most High God had to say to Moses, because Moses said to the Most High God, he said, look, the people need proof that you still exist. And he said to Moses, tell them that I am. Tell them, Ahia, Ashar, Ahia. In other words, tell them I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am Ahia that has sent me unto you. All right. So again, the Most High God is making a declaration to telling Moses to tell the people that he exists. He's more than just a name. All right. But nevertheless, let's get back to here. So in the Infinity War, through the Infinity Stones, Thanos has the power of resurrection. Kaya. All right. That's the Hebrew word for resurrection. Kaya. So resurrection means, kaya means uh, to restore life, give life, to revive, kaya. So let's get back to this opening saying. I said all that to set this up right here. So this is a, an exchange between Thanos and Loki. As Thanos is now what? Um, getting ready to kill Loki. But Thanos says this, if you consider failure experience, and Loki responds to him and says, I consider experience experience. And so Loki, uh, this is what he says to Thanos as Thanos is killing him as he's dying. He says to Thanos, you will never be a God. Interesting, right? Because Loki is supposed a God, Thor, a God. All right. So. It says here, Loki is saying to Thanos, you will never be a God. But this is what Thanos says in his response. No resurrection this time. He says, no resurrection this time. Kaya, no resurrection this time. So John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26 says this. And this is Yahweh Shai HaMashiach. Jesus Christ, this is what he's saying. He's, he's saying this right here. I am, all right, Ahaya, Ha, Kaya. In other words, I am, I exist, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth, and believeth in me shall never die. All right. So you see the contrast here. You see how Thanos is supposedly be over the resurrection. 
someone whose whole agenda is what death and destruction because he what has uh, an infatuation with lady death per se you see the difference here but let's see what apostle paul says about this first corinthians chapter 15 verse 13 and 14 but if there be no resurrection of the dead, I'll repeat it again. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, remember Thanos used this exact quote. He said, there will be no resurrection. There be no resurrection. Isn't that what Thanos said? Right. Then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. So you see the subliminal messages here using these terms by way of Thanos to saying that what? There's no resurrection. Sending the message, the subliminal message that Christ is dead, that Christ did not rise, that Christ was not resurrected, that our preaching is vain, that our faith is vain, that our hope is vain. In vain that our trust in the Most High God is in vain. Why? Because Yahweh Shai Hamashayak was tasked to restoring value, restoring hope to a lost group of people called the children of Israel. That's what salvation is to what? Salvage, to bring value, to restore value to a group of people that had lost their value. Now you see Thanos saying that their is no resurrection there will be no resurrection no coincidence in that quote all right so again he to thanos agenda his agenda is driven by his love for death remember that his agenda is driven by his love for death so according to thanos the universe needs to be corrected that's what he says right Let's go back to that quote, all right? Little one, it's a simple calculus. This universe has finite its resources, finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correcting. I'm the only one who knows that. At least I'm the only who the will to act on it. For a time, you had that same will as you fought by my side, daughter. So, Prince Williams, right? Prince Williams share the same sentiment, all right? The same sentiment is shared by Prince Williams. Okay, here's the proof. All right? Prince Williams argues for urgent depopulation efforts in Africa all right I'll read it again Prince William argues for urgent depopulation efforts in Africa all right this is a couple of quotes from that article and you can look this up all right you could google this yourself and you'll see that what I state here is facts all right so he makes these comments all right while at the same time his wife is expecting another child so this is what he says. Africa's rapidly growing human population is predicted to more than double by 2050. A staggering increase of three and a half million people per month. He goes on to say this. There is no question that this increase puts wildlife and habitat under enormous pressure. Urbanization infrastructure development, in other words, cultivation, all good things in themselves, but they will have a terrible impact unless we begin to plan and take measures now. What are those measures? Depopulation. How do you depopulate a people? How do you reduce the numbers? Start changing what they eat, that's the slow death right there. Start uh, feeding them foods that's not good for them. Start exposing them to things that's contrary to their bodies. Start chemically uh, developing foods that can, uh, that can purposely attack 
a specific group of people, literally, because they have um, pesticides that can what? Target specific insects, right? So they can do the same. They can genetically modify foods, okay? So depopulation, Prince Williams sharing the same sentiments of Thanos. So according to Prince William, right? Africa needs to be corrected, needs to be what? Depopulated. So let me share with you a prophecy from the scriptures. The prophecy of the pale horse. All right. I'll say it again. The prophecies of the pale horse. This is coming from Zechariah chapter six, verse six. The black horse. Right. The black horses, excuse me, which are their end go forth into the north country and the white go forth after them and the gristle go forth toward the south country verse 7 and the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth and he said get you hence walk to and fro through the earth so they walked to and fro through the earth so let me highlight this here the black horse Right. As we saw in the scriptures, the black horse will go to the north. Where does capitalism rule? Where does capitalism rule in this world? Where does it rule? Right. All of the capitalist countries are in the northern hemisphere. Eighty percent of the world's wealthy is found there, too. In fact, in the vernacular of the United States, the, the, the United Nations, they speak about a north-south conflict. The northern nations are the haves. The southern nations are the have-nots. You ever notice just about every community, especially when you're dealing with major cities, south side is always the lesser than the north side. South side is always the side where um, it's run down. It's very depressed. That's where you see things being sold in the south side that's not sold in the north. In the south side, that's where you see liquor stores. That's where you see uh, um, funeral homes all right next to each other and the church as well. The church, the liquor store, and the funeral hall or parlor rather right next to each other. You see things within the south side that you'll never see in the north or the west end or the east makes you think about this prophecy here makes you wonder right it's all calculated and it's prophesied so what nations are in the south primarily the poverty stricken nations in south america and also africa see the the prophecy says that capitalism goes into the north countries and catholicism goes forth after it this is true in all of Northern Europe, including Great Britain, France, Germany, and etc. right? Catholicism, right? You already know the color that's associated with the Pope. Not going to get too deep into that. Not going to go into that. That's another discussion. So the scripture says the gristle goes into the Southern, all right? So the gristle and bay make up the pale horse, which is death. The gristle represents disease, poverty, and primitive living conditions. There are countries in the Southern Hemisphere where a person's average life expectancy is 40 years of age. And so the spirit of death and famine is in the South or Southern countries. So then God goes on, right? In the scriptures, God then tells uh, the bay horse to walk to and fro through the earth because death is what everywhere death is everywhere it is on the interstates flying in the skies in the hospital corridors in homes and around the world death walks to and fro 
through the earth, hoping to snatch people, hoping to snatch the people of the Most High God. The scripture goes on to say, behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north. What does this mean? Behold, these that go toward the north have quieted my spirit in the north. What does this mean? What's the meaning of quieted my spirit? What is the meaning of this? Well, let me give you clarity. Most great religious revivals happening in our world today are happening in the southern countries, right? It's happening in the southern countries. When was the last time you heard of a revival happening or taking place in Russia, Ukraine? Something to think about. See, people living in capitalist countries are too busy to have a revival. Men, women, and children are working. No one has time for the Most High God. The Most High God made it necessary for us to have money, but the love of money is now as the scripture tells us, it's the root to all evil, all right? The love of money is the root to all evil. So the universe that's in need of correction that Prince William has stated, which falls in line with Thanos, the subliminal message that's being what? Uh, pushed out there through this movie, the universe that's in need of correction is Africa, is Africa. Let's go to another character here. Let's deal with the vision. Let's deal with the vision. In 2015, Vision made his on-screen debut within the franchise in Avengers Age of Ultron. In this film, Vision is created after Tony Starks and Bruce Banner uploaded the AI, artificial intelligence, Jarvis into a synthetic body, which was created by Ultron as a body upgrade for himself, powered by the Mind Stone. All right, there you have it right there, the Mind Stone. Remember, the Mind Stone lets the owner control the minds of others, okay? Originally, in the early Marvel comics, Edwin Jarvis was the loyal household butler of the Stark family. He is now re-imaged as Jarvis, an artificial, in other words, AI, created by Tony Starks, all right? So Jarvis, right, which is uh, the mind of the vision was created by Tony Starks, was a servant to Tony Starks, all right, to Tony Starks, excuse me. So, Vision is an AI that was created by a reckless, wealthy elitist, that's who Tony Starks is, a reckless, wealthy elitist, which was made flesh. So, Vision is an AI that was a servant created by a reckless, wealthy elitist, which was made flesh. So in the Avengers, right, Age of Ultron, when the Avengers asked Vision who he was, he answered, I am, I am. You see what's happening in these movies? Now, Vision says, I am, I am. He said it twice. He didn't say it three times. He didn't say it four times. He specifically said it twice. You heard Thanos say it, what, one time. And here you see vision, this vision, say it twice. Going back to Exodus 3.14. And God, Allah Hayim, Amar, said unto Moses, I am Ahiah, that Ashar, I am Ahia. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, in other words, Ahia, have sent me 
unto you. So vision is giving the statement that he is God, the most high God. All right. Now, another key point I want to highlight. So in this movie, Infinity War, you see Captain America, right? Captain America's team took vision, right? Took this vision, right? Took this vision that was a damaged vision, an injured vision, a crippled vision created by Tony Stark, this elitist, to Wakanda. I'll say it again. Captain America's team took a weak, a damaged and injured vision created by Tony Stark's to Wakanda and the hope, all right, and the hope, the Hebrew word for hope in the modern is tikva, but in the paleo is takawa, and the hope that Wakandan science will be able to remove the mind stone without killing the vision. Wait a minute. Remove the stone without what? Killing this vision, this weak, wounded vision, so that Wanda can then destroy the stone. Okay? Let's delve into this some more. All right? Let's delve into this some more. All right? Now, you guys remember Black Panther because uh, we have to say that Marvel, which is owned by Disney, was very calculated, did a brilliant job at promoting and getting us out to paying for their deceptions, their delusions. They did a brilliant job at getting people out of their homes and into their seats into the movie theaters and they gross over a billion dollars and they used this movie to set up Infinity War which you would think Infinity War was Black Panther Part 2. But nevertheless, let's go to the opening scene of Black Panther. In Jadaka, right? You hear him ask his father and Jobu, right? You hear him in this movie having a discussion here. He starts off with a question in Jadaka. He says, tell me a story, Baba. And Jobu, what story, my son? About home. Millions of years ago, this is in Jobu, millions of years ago, a meteorite made a vibranium, the strongest substance in the universe, struck the continent of Africa, affecting the plant life around it. And when the time of men came, five tribes settled on it and called it Wakanda. The tribes lived in constant war with each other until a warrior, Shaman, received a vision from the panther goddess Bast, who led him to the heart-shaped herb, a plant that granted him superhuman strength, speed, and instincts. The warrior became king in the first Black Panther, the protector of Wakanda. Four tribes agreed to live under the king's rule, but the Jabari tribe isolated themselves in the mountains. The Wakandans used vibranium to develop technology more advanced than any other nation. But as, and before we move forward, I just want to highlight the Jabari tribe. And I encourage you guys to research the Watusis, right? Re research the Watusis. They were giants. So the Jabari tribe, they represented giants, right? Um, Watusis, who were a hermetic people, right? They were, they are known to be giants to this day, all right? So I encourage you guys to do research on the Watusis, and you'll understand the Jabari tribe. But nevertheless, the Wakandans used vibranium to develop technology more advanced than any other nation. But as Wakanda thrived, the world around it descended further into chaos. To keep Vibranium safe, the Wakandans vowed 
to hide in plain sight, keeping the truth of their power from the outside world. And Jadaka says this, do we still hide Baba? And Jobu says, yes. And the question was asked, why? Why? Powerful scene, why? Let me share some hidden facts about the Black Panther, about the Panther. Let me give you some hidden facts here. This is coming out of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, all right? The Sim, in other words, the officiating priest, wears a panther skin as a symbol of the power to dispel the evil of death and to open the mouth, in other words, the mind of the initiate, all right? So when you see, all right, Tinchella being put under the ground after he drank from this plant, guess what? This is parallel, symbolic to this, um, this initiation that's taking place here. Now, in this, in the Book of the Dead, Egyptian Book of the Dead, right, the priest wore the panther skin, but, and, it, and it was as a symbol of power to dispel the evil of death to the open, uh, to open the mouth, in other words, the mind of the initiate. And the initiate in the movie is who? T'Challa, who's going into the ground, right? To now what? Allow the uh, powers to kick in, right? And this is a type of what? Death, burial, and resurrection, okay? Now, let me give you some more information here. So, vibranium is Wakanda's greatest asset. That's what... That's what um, we're told according to the Marvel Universe. But the most valuable asset, right, was kidnapped from Africa to build the world in its banking system. Guess what? It's slavery. I'll say it again. So uh, vibranium is Wakanda's greatest asset. But the most valuable real asset that built this entire world, that built this the Confederates that built, that built all of these different nations, these assets were kidnapped from Africa to build the world in its entire banking system. Guess what? It's slavery. It is slavery. Let me highlight something here. This is coming from slavery in the Catholic Church, all right? Page 52 and 53. Popol, all right? This is dealing with the Pope. This is dealing with the Roman Catholic Church, right? Remember, we dealt with universe, right? Universe, right? Um, the goddess of the Etruscans, the triple goddess, right? So there's no coincidence that the uh, Catholic Church and that term Catholic means what? Universe, universal, right? Universe, okay? But nevertheless, Papal grants to the kings of Portugal, giving authority to enslave the Saracens and other non-Christians of West Africa with whom Christendom is at war during 1452 through 1514. And in 1442, a Portuguese captain brought to the Gold Coast some Moorish prisoners of war, exchanged them for 10 Negro slaves and brought these back to Lisbon a trading settlement was established at Lagos by 1444. It would appear that by 1452, the Portuguese were anxious to establish their property rights over the newly discovered West African territory. And so Pope Nicholas V was approached, right, and was, and we'll deal with that real quick, but think about, according to uh, the Marvel Universe, think about where Wakanda is. Think about where Wakanda is, all right? Think about the symbolism, the parallels here, vibranium, all right? But nevertheless, let's deal with this some more, all right? Apparently led to believe that the territories of the Guinea coast were inhabited by Saracens and other enemies of Christendom. 
there is no other explanation of a series of papal documents which applied the well-known contemporary rules of war to the situation in West Africa, whereas the Portuguese were well aware the local Negro inhabitants were not Saracens, all right? So you see how a lot of deceptions uh, took place to instigate, right, the, um, the kidnapping of our ancestors to deception that was played, that, 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 that went about to encourage a war, to encourage the countries to enslave a group of people, a holy group of people. So we're well aware the local Negro inhabitants were not Saracens, were not Muslims, all right? And were not the enemies of Christendom. In 1452, Pope Nicholas V addressed a brief to King Alfonso V of Portugal, which includes the following words. And um, I'm not going to go too far in, in, into that, but I encourage you guys to be on the lookout for identity theft or presentation that I've been teaching for quite some time, for quite a few years. I'm going to do the recording and I'm going to upload it so that way you can get more information of what I just read there. But nevertheless, right, our ancestors were the vibranium, okay? Nevertheless, another thing I want to highlight here, right, in that introduction and the interaction between father and son of the Black Panthers, he says to his son, warrior Shaman received a vision from Panther goddess Bast. Now, I'm not gonna get into the word Shaman, which we can um, take it all the way to the word uh, Sheman or Semen, but I'm gonna focus on this Panther goddess Bast, all right? So the war warrior Shaman received a vision from panther goddess Bast. Let's deal with Bast. Bast, Egyptian cat goddess, mother of all cats, which were Egypt's most sacred animals. Bast's holy city, Bubastis, was said to possess the land's greatest temple. Herodotus said that in Egypt, all cats that die are carried to certain sacred houses where being first embalmed, they were buried or they are buried in the city of Bubastis. All right. So the Greeks identified Bas with Artemis or Diana. All right. Diana, right. Diana of Themyscira. That is who? Wonder Woman. OK. That is Wonder Woman but nevertheless, also called the mother of cats and claimed the great shrine of Bubastis was built in her honor. The cat's legendary nine lives stem from Artemis, right, as the mother of the nine muses, corresponding to the Egyptian Enid of nine primordial deities. So this is where you get the term cat of nine lives, all right? It comes from the goddess Bast. All right. Now, kill the lion to promote the Black Panther. Kill the lion to promote the Panther. Kill the lion. Destroy the hope to insert a perversion of the hope. Revelations 5 and 5, it says, one of the elders said unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book. This is referring to our Mash Shayak. And some would say Mashiach. This is referring to our Yahweh Shayak, Mashiach, Jesus Christ. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, our Mashiach, the, our restorer of our value, our restorer of our salvation, our restorer to bring forth value, to return the value to a lost group of people that have lost all hope. 
Let's wrap this up. So, in the Marvel Universe, Wakanda is a thriving country because of their wealth, technology, and also hiding from other depressed African nations. They dug their heads in the sand and ignored billions of people around the world just to protect their inner circle. Let's deal some more with this here. You all remember these two, Black Panther, T'Challa on the left, and you see Warmonger on the right. Let me go back here. T'Chaka, he was the truth I chose to admit. Now T'Chaka is T'Challa's father. And by this time, um, T'Challa was going through the process again to be restored. And now he's in the grave, so to speak, but this time it's um, snow and ice. And so now he's dealing with his father. He's having an exchange with his father. And he says, his father says to him, he was the truth I chose to admit. T'Challa responds to his father, all of you were wrong for turning your backs on the rest of the world. We let our fears of our discovery stop us from doing what is right. He goes on to say, no more. I cannot stay here with you. I cannot rest while he sits on the throne. He is a monster of our own making. I must take back the mountain. I must right this wrong. And this is Killmonger and his interaction with T'Challa as he was dying after they engaged in their fight towards the end. T'Challa, maybe we can still heal you, Killmonger. Why? So you can lock me up? He goes on to say, nah, bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from the ships because they knew death was better than bondage. See, what's powerful about this scene, you didn't see T'Challa say, hey, we can work something out. You know, you didn't see T'Challa say to Killmonger, no, we're, we're not going to do this to you, brother. I understand. I understand everything. He, you didn't see an olive branch. Only thing an olive branch was extended to Killmonger was to heal him and lock him up. That's powerful. That's deep. So, Revelation 13 and 17, it says this, and I'm going to tie this in. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I'll read it again. And no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. All right, y'all recognize this? This is Killmonger, okay? Y'all recognize this. But I want you to pay attention to the right side of this image. Remember that scene when he's pulling his lip down to reveal that he has the mark on his lip? He has the code. He has the proof that he's from Wakanda on his lip. Uh, let me give you clarity here. This is the interaction. This is a quote from the person that Killmonger killed as he uh, was making his way to Wakanda. He says, you can scar yourself as much as you like. To them, you're just an outsider. You're crazy to think that you can just walk in there. Ah, this is after Killmonger revealed to him that he had the mark. <laughs> you see what's happening here? You see what's, what, what, what's happening here? This is introducing what? Marks, barcodes on your skin. See, I, you, you can Google this. You can see people already putting barcodes, putting Wakanda tattoos on their lips. So this is making it what? Softening them up to what? Doing other things. Have you noticed how 
and our community tattoos are on an all-time high when i was younger guess what that wasn't so but now the bodies are so tatted up so guess what when that time comes that that barcode come to get up on your skin or get under your skin how much of a resistance will you put up because guess what little by little chipping away from everything or everyone that would oppose it so nevertheless he goes on to say ah and to think i saw you as a crazy american the whole time he had the mark of wakanda on him nevertheless let's wrap this up so let's get back to vision here wakanda hid themselves from other african countries and they are now embracing a vision <laughs> a vision the vision of whom they call the colonizers Wait a minute. They closed the doors to their brothers and sisters around the world. But now we see that they are embracing a damaged, a crippled, a hurt vision. The very one who was created by whom they call the colonizers. Now they are willing to jeopardize Wakanda, not for their own, but for the sake of what? vision to fight against Thanos all right let's 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 move forward here Thanos was born as one of the last sons of the original colonists called the Eternals remember I told you to highlight that Thanos was born as one of the last sons of the original colonists called the Eternals he was what um, born of what the original colonists. I told you to highlight original colonists. All right. So according to the Marvel Universe, Thanos is born of the original elite colonizers. He is an elite colonizers. Uh, excuse me. He is an elite colonizer rather singular. So according to the Marvel Universe, Thanos is born from the original elite colonizer that's all he is he is the elite among the colonizers truly that's why he said to starks he understands them because guess what starks had a vision which he created and thanos has a creation uh, excuse me a vision that he created see a lot of little simple things that went over so many people's heads in that movie so again thanos is born from the original elite colonizers all right so the word colonist is interchangeable with colonizer which was simply what means that that person is a member of a colonizing expedition so basically going out to what seek other territories taking things that do not belong to them colonizer thanos was what an elite colonizer john 10 and 10 the thief cometh not before to steal, to kill, to destroy. All right. That's Thanos right there. That's Thanos to steal, kill and destroy. I come. I am come. Excuse me. I am come. A higher. I am come. I exist. Right. That they might have life. Kaya. And that they might have it more abundantly all right so thanos represents a system and that system is to what steal kill and destroy but contrary to that our allah which many will say elohim but the paleo pronunciation of um, of god is allah but nevertheless says i am come that they might have life it says that they might have life. The reason why it has that word might there is that what? You have to what? Embrace it. You have to accept it. There is a criteria in order to have this life. All right. And that they might have it more abundantly. Okay. Now, again, Thanos represents 
an elite system, and that elite system is of man. And what is that elite system that we're dealing with right now? The institution of race, which was created by a man by the name of Johann Blumenbach, a system that's based off of no scientific equations whatsoever, a system that is used to create a new social identity for the entire world to draw the lines between whom they deem to be superior and those who are inferior those who have conquered and those that have been conquered and enslaved that's what this system is about it is a caste system okay so thanos represents the elite system of man Wakanda accepted a vision created by a colonizer and now they face an ultimate war called Armageddon. So they accepted a weak, they accepted a broken, they accepted a tarnished, they uh, accepted a weak, defensive, oh, excuse me, defenseless vision compromise their vision but embrace a vision that did not belong to them that belonged and created by the colonizers and now they face Armageddon which is the ultimate war the ultimate war right so in the end General Akoi had to witness her king destroyed by the system of Thanos she was the greatest warrior outside of who? T'Challa, the Black Panther. She, was, she led the, the army. But she had to see her king that she protected, that she valued, that she honored, disintegrated in her, before her eyes. Sounds familiar, right? Sounds familiar, right? See, on the battlefield, I noticed this, on the battlefield, the women soldiers of Wakanda witnessed the male soldiers, right? Their male soldiers, their male brothers fall to the system of Thanos on this battlefield, right? All through the movie, you didn't see them showing clips of uh, superheroes around the world dissolving, disintegrating. They show you an image where? From Wakanda. And also what? Out of space. All right. Not, not even in this world. All right. So that you see all the imageries, the subliminals that are here. So on the battlefield, the women soldiers of Wakanda witness the male soldiers fall to the system of Thanos. Which parallels the system of the what? Willie Lynch. The Willie Lynch system. Take the, take the strongest male and the number one male in order to teach and how to, um, you know, enslave and control the Negroes to train us like we were a wild horse, animals. So to take the most dominant male of the whole group on the plantation, beat them, embarrass them, then rip them apart by attaching them to horses. So that what? That the women, excuse me, so that the women would see that their leader, the most dominant male, could not protect them. But it didn't stop there, right? The Willie Lynch letter, right, says, then do it again. Take the second one in line. Let everyone see him. Let everyone see what you do to him. Beat him. Embarrass him. But don't kill him. See, we saw that playing out in that scene. You saw two, right? You saw two main characters. You saw the Black Panther. And you saw, I believe his name is Nighthawk or whatever, right? That has the, um, the machine wings. 
those two were killed. They were disintegrated. All right. They were disintegrated. And then you saw one left standing who had on the armor that still represented what the system, the creation of Tony Starks. All right. Go figure. Right. But nevertheless, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Ezekiel 38 says it tells us that the final battle is for restoration of Israel in Jerusalem. Yara Shalom. The final battle is for the restoration of Yasharaal in Jerusalem. Yara Shalom. The final battle, I'll say it again, is for Kaya Yasharaal Ban Yara. Shalom. That's the final battle. That's where it's going to take place at. One final point I want to make here is how the Marvel movies are becoming more and more bolder and how they mock the true Christ, how they mock the true Mash Shayak. They're becoming more bolder and blunt with how they do it. Remember this scene? And it caught a lot of chuckles inside the movies. And many don't even know that this guy, this actor, Christopher, I think his name, Christopher Platt or whatever. He professes to be a Christian. In other words, a follower of Christ. Right. But this is his exchange with Dr. Strange. Dr. Strange to Quill. That's his name inside the movie. All right. Let me ask you this one time. What master do you serve? Quill. What master do I serve? What what? Am I supposed to say Jesus? I'm from Missouri. Starks, Iron Man says, yeah, that's on earth. And I'll just leave it at that. All right. So you see the, the, the subtle snipes, the subtle attack on our Dabar Hakwarash by attacking our Mashayak to what? Kill, to still kill and destroy our hope. Our belief in what? The resurrection. All right. But nevertheless, Luke 18, 32 says this. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and he shall be mocked and spitefully and treated and spit it on. Lastly, this final thought. Thanos can be accurately compared to Nimrod. I hope this blesses someone out there. And I hope this answered the question to those that are um, that that needs more information about the chakras. I hope this gives you clarity on what chakras are and some of the other things that are highlighted inside this presentation. And I appreciate you guys for taking the time out to view this presentation. And I want to encourage you to click the subscribe button. And if you need to reach out to me, feel free to drop me an email and um, I have more information I can share. But for the sake of time, I don't want to prolong or keep this presentation going longer than what it should. But feel free to reach out to me and um, I will respond to you. Uh, feel free to reach out to me or Pastor Jerry Carr and we will respond to you. We will give you more information on this and other subject matters. So with that being said, Shalom.